We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. Today we're going to build a footbridge deep in the woods. It's a sturdy design that can add a dramatic point of interest to just about any backyard. Then we'll build a picture frame from scratch. Now, it's easy to do and ideal for showcasing family treasures. Finally, we'll make a very handy sandpaper cutter using a few scraps of wood and a hacksaw blade. Now, believe me, you'll use this for years. Now, this is gonna be fun, so grab a toolbox and let's get started. Well, today, I'm headed to Eureka, California visit Star and Esther Killing. This is it. Oh, I can see the problem. I can imagine water rushing through here. And yeah. also, these banks, I guess you were telling me, get really slick, huh? Yes, absolutely. So we don't want to be climbing up and down those. All right. Well, I have a pretty thought. good idea of well, what kind of bridge will work enough, best so here. It'll rest on four concrete blocks, or piers, two on each side of the creek. The piers will support two long beams, on top of which we'll place wooden treads or planks. Finally, we'll add a railing. Why don't we start by pre preparing the ground here? With shovels and hand tools, we begin leveling the ground where the piers will rest. Great. The soil is moist, so the digging goes quickly. Then we drop our first concrete pier into place. Did you guys see that little uh, torpedo level anywhere? We check to make sure the first pier is level. Not bad, huh? Whoa, huh? For an eyeball. Then we dig for the second pier, set it in place, and check to make sure it's level with the first. Wow, I'd say that's close enough. Now we cross to the other side of the creek and get ready to set the two remaining piers. Here, just set that right on top of the pier, would you? Mm -hmm. And just clamp that. To locate their position, we lay the ends of two 12-foot planks on the piers we just installed and extend them across the creek, measuring to make sure the planks are parallel. Okay, 34. Once in position, the ends of the planks will dictate where to locate our second set of piers. A little more digging and leveling, and the remaining piers are ready to go. That looks about perfect. Okay, great. With all four piers in place, we're ready to build our support beams. Okay, let's glue this up. The beams will be 4 by 6 timbers that we'll make ourselves by laminating two 2 by 6s together. First, Star and I apply construction adhesive to the face of one plank, then set a second plank on top. Okay, so we've got two pieces of 2 by 6 now that we're going to sandwich together. First with the glue, now I'm going to bolt these together with galvanized bolts. Star drills holes every 24 inches. I follow behind injecting silicone, which will coat the holes and keep water from leaking in and rotting the board from the inside out. Now we drive in the carriage bolts. This combination of adhesive and bolts will give us a strong, stable, warp-resistant beam. We'll go this way. Okay. Okay, time to put some galvanized washers and nuts on these carriage bolts. We so tighten the nuts that. until the washers just begin to compress the wood. Yeah. you have any animals on the property? Uh, we have an occasional bear. Bear? And uh, mountain lion's been spotted up in the back hill. All right, let's drop it down. The piers have metal straps for attaching the beams. After clamping the beams in place, we insert a drill bit into the hole in the metal strap and bore all the way through the beam. Okay. A little silicone in the hole, and we can drive in our bolts, screw on the nuts, and tighten them with a socket wrench. We purchased pre-cut posts for our railing supports and clamped them temporarily in place. You know, these uh, pre-cut posts were great fine. Already notched on the bottom, already got chamfers on the top. I mean, this has made the, this installation really simple. So let's clamp this We on. secure them to the beams by once again drilling clearance holes injecting silicone, and installing carriage bolts. 
Now we're ready to start on the treads or surface planks of the bridge. Astro, let's measure the width of these beams now. Start over here at this end, run the tape measure across to the outside. What are you getting there? 34. 34, okay. I want to make the treads like an inch longer on either side so they'll overhang, so 36 inches. Let's go cut mm -hmm. some. I give Esther a few tips on using a circular saw, and pretty soon we have all the treads we'll need. Now we can make this bridge a bridge, make it walkable, huh? We're careful to make sure the tread oh, overhangs yeah. both beams equally. Both sides, yeah. Then Star attaches it with rust-resistant deck screws. Our second board here, we're going to have to notch out to fit around this post right here. Take to do this, I first line up my speed square with the post. Put it up against the post and bring it back just a little bit because I don't want that actually too tight to fit there. This is a spacer. I want to put about a half an inch between these treads right here. And that's so that the leaves and debris won't collect on there. And then we can take our straight edge, run it right along the side of the post, back it off just a touch, and draw this line. Okay, now what we've got is this section right in here that we're going to cut out. So let's uh, put these. The notched out first. boards fit nicely into place. Right there. What a team, huh? Yeah, we're going to be across this bridge in no time. After we attach the treads, it's time to coat the cut ends with wood preservative. Well, there you go, folks. Who wants to be the first to walk across? <laughs> I do. Okay, Mister, you go first. Brave, too. I'll come right behind you. Feels pretty good, huh? Mm -hmm. Now that we've tested the bridge, it's time to install the handrails. Hey, Esther, over the top. Earlier, I drew a line on the post marking the height of the handrail. We use a clamp to hold the handrail in place and secure it with rust-resistant screws. This really is the last time you have to go into the gully, Esther. With the last plank in place and the last screw driven, it's time to enjoy the fruits of our labor. What a great way to cross this creek and what a perfect spot to watch the sunset. Nice job, guys. Well, I can hardly wait to show my neighbors. My friend Hugh Morton down at Grandfather Mountain in North Carolina is a wonderful nature photographer. And he just sent me this photo of one of the bears at the park down there. Now, I was going to take this down to a frame shop and have it professionally framed. And then I thought, you know what? This is a perfect workshop project, custom making a frame. So that's exactly what we're going to do right over here at the workbench. So come on over. We're going to build our frame out of poplar. I picked this up at the local home improvement center. And we'll be using three different thicknesses, three quarter inch, half inch, and quarter inch. So the first thing I want to do is rip this down to the proper width. Now to round over this piece of wood, we're going to use this router bit called a roundover bit. It'll mount into the router like this. And the router, in turn, is held in this router table. Now, come on under here and take a look. This is just a standard router clamped upside down. Now, normally with a router, you move the router over the work. But when you're using a router table, you're passing the work over the router. Now, this is going to form the base of our molding, our picture frame, if you will. And what we're going to do next is we're going to stack on top of this just a smaller piece of lumber. This is the half inch thick. It's going to go right on top just like that. We'll just put some glue on the bottom. But I want to get this nice and evenly spread out. So we'll take a glue spreader and just kind of paint this on here. So what we end up with is a nice even film of glue. Now we'll take this, plop it right on top of that piece that we just finished uh, routing there. I'm going to make it flush with the back. Then we'll take some spring clamps, put one of these every few inches. Here's the last one right here. Okay. Now we'll set this one aside to dry, and we'll do up a few more, just like this. Well, the glue's dried. The clamps are off. Here's that piece that we attached. Now this is what I want to do next. Remove this little piece of material right in here. It's going to actually create kind of an S curve, and to do that, we're going to use this core box bit. You can see right there how that's going to work. That's going to remove 
this material. Now see what a graceful S-curve that makes? Now I've installed a straight bit on the router and I'm cutting out a rabbit or a recess on the back side of the frame. This notch will hold the glass and photograph in place and conceal the edges. Well, this is the third piece of wood in our sort of molding sandwich, if you will. This is going to sit right on the top. And what I want to do is to create a rounded edge on this. So I've set up our router table once again for our final routing. This is a little round over bit in here. Now, this is a very thin piece of wood. So I've added a couple of blocks here and here to hold this in position, keep it from chattering, and allow me to keep my fingers well away from the blade. So let's go ahead and run this through twice, once in this direction, then we'll flip it over and run it through the other direction. There you go. See how the round shape is carried around the entire edge? Well, now we're ready to glue our third piece of molding on top of our stack of moldings, if you will, to give us a very interesting profile right here. So let's uh, do the same thing we did before. We'll take some glue. Well, here's our molding. Very nice looking profile we've got right here. Now, I need to cut angles or miters on the ends of each section. To do that more accurately, I'm using the miter gauge for the table saw to which I've attached a wood strip as an extension. I'm also using a stop block to make sure the sections on opposite sides of the frame are exactly the same length. Finally, we have some finished frame parts right here. We're going to glue these together right now. And I've made up a simple gluing jig right here with a piece of particle board or MDF. And then on top of that, another square. I made sure that this was exactly square, just screwed in place, just a few inches in from the edge. So what we're going to do is take our molding, put a little glue on the end of the miter cut here. What a pretty generous coat of glue on this because this is end grain. It tends to soak the glue up. Now, we'll take this piece, lay it up against the block, take the adjoining piece, lay it up against that edge, and then push these two together. Now, you see what the block does? The block makes certain that we have a 90 degree angle here. Grab the pin nailer here, and I'm going to nail this first from this side, and then from this side over here. And this one. And then we're just going to repeat the process. And folks, we have got a frame. Pretty as a picture, huh? And how about this portrait? Well, I've put some stain and a couple of coats of varnish on this. And I'd say it's time to make this picture perfect. So we're going to take a piece of glass, first of all, and drop this right into that rabbit that we cut earlier. Get it in there. And here's our photograph. Put a mat around the outside edge of that. We'll drop that right on top of the glass, just like so. We'll hold the photo, mat, and glass into the rabbit we cut earlier with these glazier's points used by glass installers to hold window panes in place. To protect the back and keep dust out, we'll attach a sheet of brown craft paper with masking tape. Well, there it is. You know, making your own frame can add a very personalized touch to something that's special to you. If you've got a framing job coming up, you might want to consider steel studs. They're lightweight, strong, and uniformly straight and true. But you know, one of the things I like best about working with this material is you really only need two tools, a drill and a pair of snips. Metal framed walls use a track or channel at the top and bottom. To cut them, hold the channel on edge and cut through the legs first. Then rotate the track and let the cutoff section drop, forming a crease. Squeeze the legs together with one hand and cut with the other, moving in a shallow arc. The track can be attached to a base or subfloor with drywall screws. The metal studs are inserted into the channel and held in place with short pan head screws with self-drilling tips. Once the studs are connected at the bottom, the top track is set in place and again attached with screws. Wall sections can also be built lying flat 
then stood up in place. Plastic grommets like these are inserted into pre-punched holes in the studs to protect electrical wiring. Drywall is applied in much the same way as it would be with conventional wood framing, except that the screws have finer threads designed to pierce metal. Steel studs. Well, what do you think? Should you give them a try? You got to admit, the tools are very simple. Finishing sanders like this use a quarter sheet of sandpaper. That means each time I want to get paper ready for this, I've got to take a full sheet and cut it into four equal pieces. Now, sure, I can do that with a pair of scissors or a sharp knife and a straight edge. But a while ago, somebody showed me how to make a sandpaper cutter. And this is it right over here. I've actually made a few modifications to it. And the way it works is you simply slip the full sheet in here, tear, Take the half sheet out, flip this up, and voila. I've got two perfectly shaped and perfectly sized quarter sheets of sandpaper in just a few seconds. Now I've really used this a lot over the years, and I was thinking maybe you'd like to know how to make one. I start by attaching a wooden strip along one edge of a piece of three quarter inch plywood. Then I take a second strip of wood, exactly one inch wide, and attach it to the first with a hinge. Now I'm using a piano hinge, but any small hinge will do. Now, the thing that really makes this sandpaper cutter a cutter is the blade, and for that, I use a hacksaw blade. Now, some folks use an old worn out blade. You know, these are not very expensive. So I say, why not use a new sharp one? The question is, where do you place the blade to get the right cut? Well, here's a very simple solution. Take a piece of sandpaper, fold it in half, then lay it down here on the cutter, and then trace the edge with a pencil. Now, that's exactly half. And now I can take the blade and simply lay it along the pencil line. To attach the blade, I insert a pan head screw through the holes in the ends, pass the screw through a washer I've laid on the board, and drive it in. And that's it. Now, nothing could be faster than this. Insert, tear, flip, insert, and tear. Two perfect pieces, one great cutter. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com. Step-by-step home improvement tips when you need them. Let Ron show you how to do it yourself.